Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Can't stop. Can't stop. Praising his name. Jesus. Y'all feel all right? Come on, let's get the Lord another hand praise in this house. He's worthy to be praised. Yes, he is. He's worthy to be praised. Just can't stop. Lord have mercy. If you did stop and you're wondering what's wrong in your life, you might want to go back. Praise his holy name. Amen. Amen. Father God, I come now with thanksgiving for this day. For the blessedness of life. And our portion of health and strength. And for all things being as well with us as they are. Thank you, God, for just being God all by yourself. Thank you for giving us a mind to, to get up this morning and come back out into your house of praise one more time. And to lift high the holy name of Jesus. Oh, glory. God, I can't stop praising his name. Thank you for these, your people who thought it not robbery to come today. And I pray, God, that you'll pour out from heaven a blessing upon each one, each soul that's here today, God. Whatever it is that they stand in need of, I pray, God, that you'll grant it unto them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, it's preaching time. That means that it's your time. Pray, God, that I'll decrease as you increase with me. Lord, and whatever it is that you have to be said in this church house this morning, God, that you'll use me as your instrument, your mouthpiece. Preach, Lord. Preach that these your people may hear and receive and be doers of your holy will. And I'll continue to praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Boone, for taking care of our pulpit this morning. Thank you to this choir. Amen. To these ushers, these officers of this church, to all of our distinguished visitors in your special places this morning. I thank you for being with us. Amen. See one of our deacons from one of our sister churches across, across the track over there this morning. Glad to have you and your wife this morning. Glad to have all of you to be a part of us here this morning. There is a word from the Lord today, and it's found in the 51st Psalm. Psalm 51, a familiar psalm. It's a psalm of David and Bathsheba. Uh, it's a psalm of David's repentance from his sins with Bathsheba. I'm going to read a few verses from this psalm and we'll take it from there. 50, psalm 51 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto multitude of their tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I'll teach transgressors, transgressors that were thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I'd give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God of the broken spirit, of broken and contrite spirit, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt that then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall thou offer bullocks unto thine altar. Amen. I just read the entire 19 verses from the 51st Psalm in your hearing. May God bless these words as I take for a subject today, standing in David's shoes. Standing in David's shoes. Deacon Collins, if you'll give me just a little more volume on this mic this morning so I can back up off of it just a little bit, please, sir. I appreciate that. Amen. Amen. Standing in David's shoes. Yeah. Um, many of us are familiar with David's escapades with this peasant girl named Bathsheba. In this particular story, we see a king who abuses his power in such a way as to commit two heinous sins, namely rape and murder. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system could aid the child of God in all but two areas. And David had committed both of them, and worse yet, he thought that he'd gotten away with it. Murder was considered death to the body, and rape was death to the soul. This story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 12 and 15. And my guess is that Many of you are also familiar with the story of the confrontation between David and the prophet Nathan. Y'all remember that? Well, Nathan tricked the king with the story of a poor man who had only one little lamb, a lamb that, that, that he held in his bosom and a lamb that, that ate out of his plate at his table. And, 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 and he said that there was a rich man down the street who had flocks and herds. And, and there was a wayfarer who stopped by the rich man's house one day and he stayed for dinner. And rather than the rich man killing one of his many sheep and feed it to his wayfaring friend, he sat down to his neighbor and took his only little lamb, slew it and fed it to his Yes, for dinner. That story brought out indignation in King David, and he said, as sure as the Lord lives, such a man must die. And then the prophet pointed the finger, and he said, you are the man. You are the man. What we are about to study today is the psalm that David writes after this confrontation with Nathan. Just after he realizes the gravity of his sin and the weight of the guilt that fell upon him when the point, when the finger of blame was pointed at him. Now, we live today in a world where religion intersects Sometimes they clash, and many of us are left wondering about the practices of some of these traditions. Today, I'm 
praying that God will allow me to, to be used to clear up a Catholic practice that has been integrated into the Protestant church. It's called Lent. Lent. Lent is basically a time of fasting. It's a time of showing your reasonable sacrifice to God. I know that you, 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 you hear about it all the time, and, and we practiced it in some forms here at this church for a good long time. But as you may or may not know, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday for the Orthodox Church. Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday comes right behind Fat Tuesday, right? <laughs> I know most of us are real familiar with Fat Tuesday. <laughs> Lent, however, is a time of remorse. Fat Tuesday is a time of party. Lent is a time of penance, a time of inward reflection. It's a time of preparation for the celebration of the death and, more importantly, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Lent is. The 51st Psalm is a wonderful example of the penitent heart the heart of the church during this season. Now, we have integrated this season along with some other fasts because not everybody likes to fast for 40 days. <laughs> Amen. So, so, so in the Protestant church, during this particular season, we have integrated Daniel's fast. And Daniel had several fasts. He had a 21-day fast, had a 10-day fast, and of course we've added a 7-day fast, a 3-day fast, and some of us just fast on Saturday before Easter. <laughs> but it's all good. If that's your way of showing God your sacrifice for what he has done for us, then that's your way. And that's totally between you and God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, in a very real sense, Lent is about understanding the 51st Psalm of David. It's about standing in David's shoes. Y'all work with me here for a little while. As such, I, I want to... I want to take a closer look at this psalm to help you better understand the true nature of the season of Lent. Today I've broken this psalm down into three parts. Part one, the confession of David. Part two, the commitment of David. And three, the cleansing of David. If you work with me just a little while, I think that you'll get a good understanding of what this is all about. So let's begin by looking at First, the confession of King David, verses 1 through 6. David first acknowledges his sin, verses 3 through 5. He, for, he said, for I acknowledge my transgressions. I was brought forth in iniquity. Iniquity, synonymous with sin, if you will. David's confession is honest in that he doesn't try to excuse his sin as insignificance. He calls it in verse 4, evil. Now, it's not insignificance. It, it, it's real. David doesn't try to pass the blame on to somebody else other than himself, like some of us sometimes. He, he, in verse 2, he says, my sin. My iniquity. He says, I sin. Unlike Adam in, in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam, Adam put the blame on everybody he could blame. It wasn't nobody there but, his, but God and his wife. He said, that woman that you gave me, y'all to blame. No, not David. He, he took just the opposite approach. Against you, he says, you only have I sinned against. And lastly, David makes an astounding comment. He, 
He doesn't even recognize his sin against Uriah and against but, 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 and Bathsheba, but against God alone. David realizes that the gravity of his sin is larger than what he did to Uriah and Bathsheba. But he finds himself hopelessly outside of the grace of an almighty God. How many of you have felt like you've been out of God's grace? At the root of David's sin was God and God's people because he was the king. He was the overseer of the people of God. So David appeals to God's grace, verses 1 and 2. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to your loving kindness, have mercy upon me. David begins his confession with a plea for mercy. You know, I used to hear my grandmother say that, Lord, have mercy. Some of us in here right now have made that same exclamation, Lord, have mercy. We want God to have compassion, to ease up these burdens, whatever it is. So, so, so David seeks the compassion. He was willing. He, he, he wasn't willing to give that compassion to Uriah and Bathsheba, but he was now begging God for that compassion. I want you to put yourself right there because today you are standing in David's shoes. David reminds God of his love. And then he says in verse 1, he says, blot out my transgressions. Now the word blots mean to literally cover up. It, it means to make it vanish, make it disappear. David want God to put away his sin by covering them up. A true and penitent heart sees nothing but its sin and its misery of conscience. I don't know if you've ever been there, but, 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 but if you've ever been to a point in your life where you just felt like you were ugly outside and particularly down on the inside because of some act that you had created against somebody else. It's not pretty. When we write something that we don't want anybody else to read, sometimes we just blot it out. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We, 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 we blot it out so that it won't ever be seen again. That's right. It's gone forever. <clears throat> David wants God to forget what's unforgettable and to blot it out so that he can be free from the guilt that's lying on top of him right now. For reprieve, he says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities. David pleads for reprieve from the guilt of his sin because in verse 3 he says, my sin is always before me. Our sin's always before us too. That's why today, as I go through this message, I want you to feel like you are standing in David's shoes. All of us have sinned according to Paul and come short of the glory of God. David asked God to, to wash the dirty sins off him so that he doesn't have to live with it, that he may be made clean. David comes to a place where he truly saw how ugly his sin was in the eyes of God. And David feared God. And according to Psalms 111 and verse 10, that, that, that the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There are too many of us who have no fear for man nor God. That means that we are fools within ourselves. Out of this clarity, out of this fear, David's confessions flow. You know, in the Catholic Church, parishioners go in to the father, to the priest, and, 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 and they confess their sins. And when they get done confessing, which is mostly a partial list of the stuff that they've already done, <laughs> the priest would tell them, you're forgiven, my son. Go in peace. Now, we don't do that in the Protestant church. Over here where in, the, in the Baptist church, where, where, where the Lord let us come and and, 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 and visit with him on Sunday morning. We, we, we done figured out that we can talk to God directly, hadn't we? 
we can tell him everything. <laughs> we don't have to hold back nothing. You know, sometimes you don't want to tell the preacher quite everything. But it's all right to tell God because he ain't talking. <laughs> he ain't telling none of our business, Brother Robert. <laughs> no, 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 no. He are, he's all right. But, but I, I heard a story recently about a priest who sat in confessionals. And, and, and what he did, when he went in, he had a list of sins with him. And when a parishioner would come in, rather than the parishioner telling the preacher about what he had done and all these things, <laughs> Dr. Smith, what, what the preacher would do was, he said, well, you did, did you do this, 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 and, he, and the list just kept going. And by the time that he was done with his list, most of the parishioners would be in full-fledged tears, alligator tears. Because they didn't come to tell him all of the stuff, but he had already decided that these are the things that you need to confess today. <laughs> they didn't realize how sinful they were until they heard it read out loud by the preacher. Nathan did a similar thing for David. And today... I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to point the finger of blame. You are the man. You are the woman. You. You. You're the one. You're the one who committed murder. Murder. By your words. You assassinated your brothers and your sisters. You are the ones who raped your brothers and your sisters, killed their souls, and they're just as dead as if you had shot them or stuck them with a spear. You are the man. This season of Lent, let, let's just take time to consider the righteousness of the God we worship. And it'll drive us to confess just like David did. Lent is a time to look, at, look with clarity at all of our sins that we may see how truly sinful we really are. And we are some sinful creatures. Sometimes we have to go back into that closet with all of those rattling bones and throw them out. <laughs> Clean out the closet. Stare at them. Talk to them. Then is a time for our sins to be ever present before us, to acknowledge it and not pass it off as some petty little thing that we've done. It's not petty. Sin is sin. It's a time to realize that we are David. David. So we've seen the confession. We've seen that it plays a significant role in, 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 in Lent, but, but so does commitment. Let's look at it. Lent is not only about confessions of our sin, it's also the desire to change the way that we've been doing business. To change the way that we have been doing things that hurt other people. Look with me, if you will, at the commitment David makes to God. Should God choose to forgive him for his sins? He's negotiating with God here. David commits in verses 13 through 15 to, to change by teaching transgressors. Listen to what he said. I'll teach transgressors your way. Have mercy. Isn't that what we do in the Baptist church? We came here to teach folks who won't do right the ways of God. David makes a commitment to God to learn from what he's already done and to share the lessons that he learned with others. David shows true remorse with the desire to help others avoid the pain and suffering and the separation from God. And he shows that he's sincere because he's still teaching today. 
This is David's song. This is his testimony that I'm going through here right now. David is still teaching. He said in verse 14, my tongues will sing aloud of your righteousness. You got to remember that David was a famous musician. He's the same guy who, who played the harp and calmed the soul of King Saul. This is the same David. David commits here to a public ministry of making known the righteousness of God. This is the equivalent of giving our testimony, my brothers and sisters, and sharing in public the righteousness of God. A changed heart. Verse 15, open my lips and my mouth will show forth your praise. And lastly, David commits to a life of thankfulness and praise to no longer take for granted the mercy of God, but to praise the God who set him free from the burden of his sin. Matthew 12 and 34, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Here we see the wonderful fruits of a, of a penitent heart that has properly acknowledged and confessed sin. It's the fruit of commitment, a renewed commitment to worship God and to make him known throughout all the world. Luke chapter 7 verse 47 teaches that those who have been forgiven much love much. But the word also says to whom much is given. Hallelujah. Much is required. God has forgiven each one of us each time that we have come to him and confessed our sins and asked him for forgiveness. And yet, we don't bother to tell nobody else about how great our God is. On a day like this, this church house ought to be flowing over because of people that you told how good God has been just to you. Romans 2 and 4, Paul said, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to your repentance? The goodness of God leads to your repentance. To be forgiven is the ultimate example of God's love, and it's this love of Christ that 2 Corinthians 5 and 14 says that he compels you. Compels you. Lent is a time where we commit to change, and that happens as we realize who we are. Who am I? Somebody wrote in a song, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Let's, let this Lenten season be a time of spiritual renewal that we may change, that, that we may commit to the praise of God, to singing songs of joy and worship God with our lips. And let our commitment be to share the joy of God's forgiveness with everybody that we come in contact with. Remember that Lent is a time where we can say, we are David. I stand in David's shoes not only in guilt, but in our response to God's mercy. That's why I stand in David's shoes. I am forgiven. When blind Bartimaeus cried out, Lord, have mercy, <clears throat> and was finally brought into the presence of Jesus, Jesus asked this question. He said, you, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And today, David answers that same question. He says, I want to be made clean. I want to be made clean. David asked God in verses 13 through 15 to remove his sins. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Wash me. Wash me. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 22, God talks about hyssop. He uses hyssop as the instrument that dipped, that was dipped into the blood that struck the doorpost where the death angel was coming through on that night. Hyssop is a cleansing agent. All of us could stand a dose of it. 
wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. David longs to be whiter than snow. He, see, currently stands in his dirty state. To be clean is a wonderful feeling. Imagine not being able to wash yourself totally clean. How others would perceive you is going to be what's on your mind first, but then how you perceive yourself is going to be on your mind. Can anybody smell me? Is my face clean? <laughs> How do I look? He says, restore my joy in verse 12. He says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. The problem with sin is that we see only the gloom of the world when we were in it. There is no joy. David asked God to return to him the joy of intimacy with God that Life may have meaning again. Life without God has no meaning. You're just wandering around like a dog chasing his tail. There's nothing without God. This is also a request from God to repair in David the brokenness that God's righteousness has caused in him. When God's righteousness hits you and you realize what a wretched mess that you really are, you can't help but to repent. He says, renew his spirit in verse 10b. He said, renew a steadfast spirit in me. And lastly, David asked that God make their relationship what it once was by filling him with the spirit of God. If God's spirit doesn't live in you, then you need to check on your religion. Something is wrong someplace. David realizes that the avoidance of sin is the work of the Spirit in us. And in order to continue forward in righteousness, he required a steadfast spirit. A spirit that will not leave me when I'm at my most needed time. I don't want to be in no dark alley without the Spirit of God. Not even if I got two big guys with me. David is seeking restoration and cleansing, the removal of his sins, the return of his joy, and the renewal of his spirit. This cleansing can only come from God, and as such, David is pleading with God, wash me. This was the anguished prayer of King David, wash. Wash was the meaning that, of, it was what John the Baptist was doing down in the river of Jordan. Jesus was pleading with Peter one day because he had washed all of the feet of his disciples and Peter was saying, you ain't washing me. You ain't washing my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you ain't going to have no part with me. Wash me. Wash me. Peter said, well then, Lord, I got to have a part with you, so don't just wash my feet, wash my face, wash, my, wash me all over. Wash me. Lent is not only a time of penance, but also a time of hope. It begins with a season of dying to oneself and ends with new life on Resurrection Sunday. So regardless to, 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 to which one of these sacrifices that you decide to make to God, make to your God, whether it's the 40 days or the 21 days or the 14 days or the 7 days or the 3 days or the 1 day, On Easter Sunday morning, when Jesus gets up from the dead, you need to feel like a new creature in Christ. So today, Jesus is asking you, what do you want from me? What do you want? So let this linen season be our answer. That we see our sin and seek to remove it from us. That we cry out for our joy that he may return it to us, that we die to ourselves and long for a spiritual renewal as we go through this season. And remember, today, you're standing in David's shoes. and You're in need of a cleansing. 
So in conclusion, Lent is a time of confession, commitment, and cleansing. And in our psalm today, we've seen not just a man named David, but we've seen Omar Reed, Larry Martin, Brother Robert, Sister Connie. We've seen you, you, and you standing in David's shoes. You need to come to terms with your own sins. We need to meditate upon this passage of Scripture. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. I love this Scripture. I probably preached 10 sermons, different sermons, from this one passage of Scripture over the years. But never have I preached one that's more important than the one that you've just heard. You are standing in David's shoes. We need to confess our sins to the Lord <clears throat> and praise him continually for cleaning us up, giving us an opportunity to make it into the kingdom of heaven because that's what this is all about. I don't show up here on Sunday mornings just for my health. I come in here so that we'll make sure that there's nobody who's left out of the kingdom of heaven. God wishes that everybody be saved. Everybody. The lowest of sinners. That's why Jesus died. That's why he got up from the grave on the third day morning with all power so that you and I would have the right to the tree of life. We're going to open the doors of the church. There may be somebody who desires to start your cleansing process today. Somebody who wishes to repent for your wrongdoings to God and start your life afresh. This is a good day could be the first day of the rest of your life with Jesus. The doors are open. Will there be one?
Sometimes I'm up and then sometimes I get so down. Lord, I can almost level. I can sometimes level. 